From Washington, D.C., CBS News presents an address by John F. Kennedy, President of the United States. The President will speak to members of the American Society of Newspaper Editors who are holding their 39th annual convention at the Statler Hilton Hotel. Originally, the Chief Executive was to have lunched with the editors, but early today he changed his plans, presumably because of the international situation and because he wanted more time to devote to his address. The President met with his cabinet during the morning. The session had been scheduled some time ago, but it's understood that the Cuban situation was discussed. Mr. Kennedy's address this afternoon is expected to deal with both the Cuban and the Laotian situations. The arrangements suggest a speech of major importance. Introducing the President will be Turner Catledge, managing editor of the New York Times and president of the Editor Editor's Society. Now here is Mr. Catledge. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. <laughs> Mr. Catledge, members of the American Society, newspaper editors, ladies and gentlemen. President of a great democracy such as ours and the editors of great newspapers such as yours owe a common obligation to the people, an obligation to present the facts, to present them with candor, and to present them in perspective. It is with that obligation in mind that I have decided in the last 24 hours to discuss briefly at this time the recent events in Cuba. On that unhappy island, as in so many other arenas of the contest for freedom, the news has grown worse instead of better. I have emphasized before that this was a struggle of Cuban patriots against a Cuban dictator. While we could not be expected to hide our sympathies, we made it repeatedly clear that the armed forces of this country would not intervene in any way. Any unilateral American intervention in the absence of an external attack upon ourselves or an ally would have been contrary to our traditions and to our international obligations. But let the record show that our restraint is not inexhaustible. Should it ever appear that the inter-American doctrine of non-interference merely conceals or excuses a policy of non-action, if the nations of this hemisphere should fail to meet their commitments against outside communist penetration, then I want it clearly understood that this government will not hesitate in meeting its primary obligation, which are to the security of our nation. <laughs> Should that time ever come, we do not intend to be lectured on intervention by those whose character was stamped for all time on the bloody streets of Budapest. Nor would we expect or accept the same outcome which this small band of gallant Cuban refugees must have known that they were chancing, determined as they were against heavy odds to pursue their courageous attempts to regain their island freedom. But Cuba is not an island unto itself, and our concern is not ended by mere expressions of non-intervention or regret. This is not the first time in either ancient or recent history that a small band of freedom fighters has engaged the armor of totalitarianism. It is not the first time that communist tanks have rolled over gallant men and women fighting to redeem the independence of their homeland. Nor is it by any means the final episode 
in the eternal struggle of liberty against tyranny anywhere on the face of, glo of the globe, including Cuba itself. Mr. Castro has said that these were mercenaries. According to press reports, the final message to be relayed from the refugee forces on the beach came from the rebel commander when asked if he wished to be evacuated. His answer was, I will never leave this country. That is not the reply of a mercenary. He has gone now to join in the mountains countless other guerrilla fighters who are equally determined that the dedication of those who gave their lives shall not be forgotten and that Cuba must not be abandoned to the communists. And we do not intend to abandon it either.